Good morning and welcome to the Modesto Church of the Brethren. I am Pastor Andrew and I am happy to see each of you here this morning or sometime this week. Um, please note that you can share any joys, concerns, prayer requests, or if you would just like to chat with one another in the space bar below, feel free to do that. This week, we will be having our Bible study on Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock, so if you would like to join in that, please feel free to either message this page or you can email me directly um, if, you have, if you would like to do that or if you have any questions about what it may entail. If you are able to donate to our work and ministry, please go to our website, www.modcob.org. We appreciate any help that you can um, offer to us at this time. We thank you for your contributions. Now, if you'll please join with me in a time of prayer. And I would like to thank the Reverend Mindy Walton Mitchell for her contribution to this. God of all seasons, we do not know what lies ahead, but we know we are not alone. We know that you will see us through this season of Corona tide. You are with us as we continue the struggle for justice. You have led us through great trials in the past, and though we have forgotten, the scriptures tell us of the hardships your people faced and how they survived. We too will survive this. God of all time, remind us that you will see us through, that we will live into new struggles, new seasons, new trials, and will help us then as you have been with us and are with us now. May we know in this moment that your presence is with us in our very breath. Now and always we give thanks and praise to you, O Ancient of Days. Amen. Our first song for today, or first hymn for today, is Here in This Place by, um, I always mispronounce his name, but this is one of our favorites from church and is being sung today by Elaine and Maddie and Linda W. So thank you all for your help and contributions.
Our scripture for this morning comes from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, a group of Pharisees met to consider new questions that might trip up Jesus. A legal expert thought of one that would certainly stump him. The Pharisees asked Jesus, Teacher of all the laws, which commandment is the greatest? Jesus, quoting scripture back to them, said, Love the eternal one, your God, with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is nearly as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The rest of the law and all the teachings of the prophet are but variations on these themes. We will now have a time for the children, and with that, we'll be led today by Kelly. And we thank you, Kelly, for your uh, help in today's worship service. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that everyone is doing really well right now, and that I hope that we're all staying, staying safe and sound. Um, I was really excited when Andrew asked if I could speak today about for the children's time because um, I was one of the people who had been in charge of like creating Peace Week and get, getting everyone together and figuring it out. And it was such a really great experience that we wanted to continue to bring that forward to you guys for those of, for those of the children and as well as the adults who were unable to make Peace Week. So um, my understanding is that the last few weeks we have been having people who um, some, the leaders from the for the last three weeks have read stories from because we did a, a different story every day and we were focusing on E is for equity was our theme. So um, today we're going to be reading the I'm going to be playing the story uh, something happened in our town. And the reason why we chose this book, it, it happened on Tuesday, which I felt was the happiest day because our focus was on, um, totally spacing on the day. It wasn't Black Lives Matter, but it was talking about equity and it was, it really, it versus equality and it really gave an emphasis on the terminology that we used as well as talking about the new stories that have been happening in our in all of our lives and trying to try to start those conversations with with our children about it so that way they can understand because they will they deserve to be um to be a part of the conversation too as as much or as little as uh we wanted to give them so i'm going to be sharing the story and it's read actually by a person of color and um annalise and i we were both the leaders and we felt like it was important that way to hear it from a person of color speaking it because this is impacting it's it's hurting other people who are who are people of color at a at a much a much bigger time than other people so we felt like it would be really helpful to hear it from from someone who's been experiencing this so um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then you're going to be able to get to see all the pictures and you're going to get to hear the story Something happened in our town, a child's story about racial injustice. By Marianne Solano, Marietta Collins, and Ann Hazard. Illustrated by Jennifer Zivion. This story is read with permission by Imagination Press. Something bad happened in our town. The news was on the TV, the radio, and the internet. The grown-ups didn't think the kids knew about it, but the kids in Miss Garcia's class heard some older kids talking about it, and they had questions. After school, Emma asked her mother, why did the police shoot that man? It was a mistake, said her mother. I feel sorry for the man and his family. Yes, the police thought he had a gun, said her father. It wasn't a mistake, said her sister Liz. The cops shot him because he was black. Emma was confused. He is 
brown, not black, she said. Some black people have dark brown skin and some have light brown skin, Emma's father explained. Black usually means African American. Most of their ancestors were brought here from Africa as slaves. I know what a slave is, said Emma. That's when you have to do whatever the other person says. Yes, slaves had to do whatever white people told them to do. Even after slavery ended, white people didn't let black people live where they wanted, go to school with white people, or vote. Who are white people? White people came from places in Europe or Russia or other countries. We are white people, even though our skin is light tan. Did our family do those bad things a long time ago? Emma asked. Yes, answered her mother. Back then, many white people thought that they were better than black people, even though it wasn't true. Liz added, some white people still think most black men and boys are dangerous, even though they're not. Was the man that got shot dangerous? Asked Emma. No, her mother said. Shooting him was a mistake. It was a mistake that is part of a, a pattern. Like a pattern on my blanket? Emma asked. Yes, but this pattern is being nice to white people and mean to black people. It's an unfair pattern. Suppose you had a birthday party and invited everyone in your class except the black kids, her mother said. How would the black kids feel? They would be sad, Emma said, or mad. And you would be missing out because you never know who is going to be your best friend, said Liz. And you can help others to be fair, said her mother. Like telling Anna to stop teasing Ling about her name, asked Emma. Her mother gave her a hug. Yes, just like that. In another house, Josh asked his mother, Can police go to jail? Yes, said his mother. Why do you ask? That white policeman who shot the black man, said Josh, will he go to jail? What he did was wrong, said his mother. But he won't go to jail, said his father. Why not, asked Josh. Cops stick up for each other, said Josh's brother Malcolm. And they don't like black men. Josh was confused. Why not? Some police are black. You're right, said his mother. Uncle James is a police officer, and so is my friend Kenya. There are many cops, black and white, who make good choices, said his father. But you can't count on them to always do what's right. Malcolm added, I can get stopped by the police just because I'm black, even if I don't do anything wrong. That's not fair, Josh said. What if it was a white man in a car? Would the police have shot him? They probably wouldn't even have stopped the car, said his father. Sometimes white people are treated better than black people, said his mother. But it's not right. Everybody should be treated fairly. Josh's mother gave him a hug. We're proud of who we are. Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela were strong and brave black leaders. They showed us that we can stand up for our rights and set good examples for others. They were treated unfairly, but helped others learn to be more fair. Some people haven't learned, said his father angrily. Why are you mad, asked Josh. I'm mad that we're still treated poorly sometimes, but I can use my anger to make things better, said his father. Black people have a lot of power if we work together to make changes. I have power, Josh said, and I'm smart. His father smiled. You're right. His mother added, and you can change people's hearts by sticking up for someone who is not treated fairly. Like Malcolm sticks up for me when the kids tease me about my glasses, Josh asked. He tells them to step off. Just like that, his parents said. The next day, 
a new kid joined Emma and Josh's class. His name was Omad and he was from a country far away. Omad didn't know where to sit or what to do because it was his first day in school. He talked a little bit, but it was hard to understand him. He said he was learning English. After lunch, the class went outside to play soccer. Daniel and Sophia picked kids to be on their teams. All of the kids were picked to be on a team except Omad. Daniel said Omad probably didn't know how to play because he was new. Sophia said Omad might not be good at soccer. Josh remembered what his mother said about sticking up for people who were treated unfairly. Emma remembered what her mother said about unfair patterns in birthday parties. All of a sudden, Omad wasn't alone. Emma and Josh were leading him to their team. We have enough kids on our team, Daniel said. We don't need him. But Josh was ready. Step off, he said. He's playing. Yeah, said Emma. We don't want to miss out. And just like that, Emma and Josh gained a new friend and started a better pattern in their school. So obviously um, that that story is it tackles a lot of issues that we are still dealing with today and we're seeing where you might be you might be seeing pictures of black people that have been that have been hurt or you might hear stories about it and the reason why we chose this story is because we wanted you guys to understand what was going on. Um, so I really hope that you were able to pick up something from this story and, um, and, learn, and learn a lesson from it. So with that said, let's go ahead and if you have your parents with you or if you have someone, if you have your sibling right next to you, go ahead and take their pinky. I don't have anyone because Ezra, Sean is feeding Ezra right now, so I'm going to take my own pinky. And let's go ahead and have a quick prayer. Dear God. <laughs> We really are looking to you for guidance to make sure that we can make the right decisions to help everyone stand up for what is right. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, thank you, Kelly, for that reminder, then that uh, the story that teaches us all what we can do. A common question that I have received is, why does your ch church do blank? Fill, you can fill in that blank. But oftentimes the question refers to something that we are doing that is aimed directly at meeting people's needs, such as, why is it that your church works or volunteers at 9th and D? Or why does your, fa your church host Family Promise? Or like I said, any other number of social service type projects. This is a fair question and, and is one we need to examine and re-examine periodically as a church. The progressive wing of the church is criticized for being little more than a social service agency. However, today's scripture makes it clear why we do what it is that we do. We take the words, teachings, and actions of Jesus seriously in our lives and our faith. In this reading from the Gospel of Matthew, we hear Jesus replying to a religious leader who has come to critique him and tells the man that we are to love God and our neighbor. This is not a one-time occurrence as he does this throughout the different gospel accounts. Jesus' answer to the lawyer is rooted within his Jewish upbringing as the first part of his answer comes directly from the Shema and is something that all should be able to recite during, at, during his time and now. Therefore, part of the reason for doing things like we do is rooted within Judaism. 
This is important for us to remember. We do what we do because of our faith, and these actions have a long established history. We often refer to today's scripture as the greatest commandment, as it may be Jesus's most well-known saying. However, as I was rereading these verses, it dawned on me that this is a three for one. The, the Pharisee is asking for one answer, and instead Jesus gives him three. So maybe we should slightly rephrase the scripture as the greatest commandments, and add an S, make sure to plural, pluralize it. Part one of the answer is found in when Jesus says, love the eternal one, your God, with all of your heart and all your soul and all your mind, in verse 37. Again, Jesus is quoting the Shema and the most central tenet of faith within Judaism, or at least one of the most important texts within Judaism, in my opinion. We can find this in our Bibles in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9. If we look around us within our common, within our society today, we may see some Orthodox Jews who are wearing these boxes upon their heads or upon their arms called tefillin. This scripture from Deuteronomy is one of the te three texts that they carry within those boxes. Within the first part of his answer, Jesus essentially answers the Pharisee's question. And yet, as I mentioned, he doesn't stop there. Who would dare, especially someone who knows the laws, to question Jesus's answer as invalid? I imagine that this first part of his answer silenced the skeptics and allowed him to proceed on without interruption. The second part begins with Jesus saying, love your neighbor. As I was looking through many English translations, I saw most of them try to relegate that this is not as important as loving God, but this is not what Matthew intends. Matthew intends that this should be read as just as important as loving God. Loving God is as important as loving neighbor. Service has been an important practice to the Church of the Brethren throughout all of our history, and it is so for us at the Modesto Church of the Brethren. Yet sometimes it is looked down upon because it seems to focus on earthly needs and not upon heavenly rewards. However, Jesus' words spell out clearly that his teaching is not an either-or proposition. If we love God, then we are also to love our neighbors. And if, we are lo and if we love our neighbors, then we should also love God. The two cannot be separated. So do not feel judged when you are feeding the hungry and not what some would call saving souls for Jesus. The question that arose from this week's Bible study is what does Jesus mean by the word love? After all, we use that word love a little too easily or perhaps when another word should be used in its place. Just the other evening, I was watching one of my favorite television shows, The Big Bang Theory. In that episode, Leonard leans to Penny and says, I love you, and Penny remains quiet. Later in the episode, Penny says, cheese fries, I love them. Same word, two different contexts, and perhaps two different meanings as well. Part three of Jesus' answer is, as yourself, <clears throat> which follows, love your neighbor as yourself. I used to call this scripture a twofer, as it seemed to be a two for one, but it was in reading through this week that it occurred to me that Jesus has included a third part, that we are to love ourselves may be the most overlooked part of this commandments. And not only is this often passed over, but it may also be the most difficult of the three to do. Look what is happening within our society. 
If we look around us, we see that people are turning to various substances and different ways to dull the pain of not being able to love themselves. However, many times that they, the pain that they feel so acutely is something that cannot be seen by us. And this is a time for the church to step forward and reaffirm the value and the importance of all. We can shout, God loves you at the top of our lungs, but we cannot simply say it. We must show God's love to others and we must love them as well. And whether or not you're tuning in for the first time, please know that as an inclusive, supportive, and affirming congregation, Modesto Church of the Brethren has a place for you. And so it is that we do what it is that we do because we seek to love God and to love our neighbors and to love ourselves. Amen and amen. We'll share with you the joys and the concerns that have been shared with us today. <clears throat> First, I would like to express as a joy the appreciation that I have felt for your patience with our technical difficulties here this morning. Another joy that I have to share is from Luella, who thanks, us, thanks you all for your prayers during the times and the well wishes. Um, and she has found out that she does not have the coronavirus. So we rejoice with you, Luella. That is good news. Sherry asked for prayers for the Clayman family as in the uh, recent loss of their son. Kelly shares with us the joy that she and Sean have both tested negative for COVID and we rejoice with them in that as well. We also share a concern from Kelly for Greg, who has tested positive for COVID last week, um, but his fever has broke. So we pray for continual healing for Greg and the many within his life that are impacted by it. Bonnie shares a concern for the church members and others in our community who are feeling depressed and isolated due to the necessity of distancing. And yes, we lift up the concern as well. We request prayers for Oh, Monique requests prayers for her friend. Lift those up to God. And Mary P. asks for uh, healing as she has surgery on her hand. And we pray for the family that has multiple 
um, COVID cases uh, within their family. I'm sorry, I missed the, the name on that. And we give praise that uh, Sue has shared and we give praise that David M has returned home and we are grateful and pray, we continue to pray for healing, but pray that you have, with joy that you have been, come back together or be able to be together again. We also light one candle for the joys and the concerns which we have kept to ourselves. Mary P. Lundquist has a play that is actually Nick's friend, Agnes P., not Mary. Oh, it's... Agnes P. Agnes P., who is having hand on her surgery, or having surgery on her hand and not Mary having surgery on her hand. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we move through a time that is filled with unknowns and uncertainties. We pray for your presence. We pray for your presence of healing and of calm and to know that you are with us even when we feel that we are by ourselves, alone and isolated from the ones that we love. Be with all of those who seek healing. Be with all of those who are alone. Be with those who are rejoicing that we may rejoice with them. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. I pray that you or hope that you will join with me as we sing our final song. And I would like to thank Harold uh, Cooperwriter for leading that for us today. There are things in every journey that can break us. to our knees, but it's in those moments when our faith is recast, and we simply stand our ground and just believe. Heaven, hallowed be your 
name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in Blessings to each of you as you go forward this week, knowing that the love of God surrounds you every day and at every moment. Amen and amen.